It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. John Steinberg is the founder and CEO of Cheddar, a new video media company positioned at the intersection of business news and culture. Prior to launching his new company, he held executive leadership roles at DailyMail.com North America and BuzzFeed. He sits on the board of Bustle and is an advisor to The Skim and Tabula. He has received multiple recognitions from Ad Age, being named to their list of 40 under 40 in 2015 and one of its media mavens in 2012. Before starting Cheddar, Mr. Steinberg was most recently the chief executive officer of DailyMail.com North America. He played a leading role in building the company's digital media assets in the U.S., including Daily Mail's acquisition of Elite Daily and the launch of Truffle Pig, a joint venture with Snapchat and WPP. He joined DailyMail.com from BuzzFeed, where he was president and chief operating officer. Under his leadership, BuzzFeed grew from 15 employees to 500 and became a global and profitable social advertising business, working with more than half of the top 100 brands. Mr. Steinberg's earlier titles include Strategic Partner Development Manager on Google's Small Medium Business Partnerships team, and while in high school, intern in Walt Disney Imagineering's Research and Development Group. Mr. Steinberg is a graduate of Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and holds an MBA from Columbia University. He sits on the board of Temple Israel and lives with his wife, kids, and cat on New York's Upper East Side. Please help me welcome John Steinberg. <sighs> Thank you, Michelle. President Bollinger, Dean Boyce, and class of 2016, thank you for inviting me to speak at your class day ceremony. It's a great honor to wish the class of 2016 my most sincere congratulations as this chapter ends and a new chapter begins. The blank space between pages doesn't happen that often, and it is a unique time for reflection on the past and hopes for the future. I've had more chapters than most for someone of my age, and I love the blank space moments between them. So it's an additional privilege to be here with you today for your blank space moment. I also congratulate your families and friends because none of this does it alone, as my story here today will confirm. I'm going to tell you my life story up through now. I will try to avoid advice because one of my many flaws is that I don't like advice. Some people tend to seek it out. I tend to avoid it. And when I say I have many flaws, I don't say that in the cliche, self-effacing kind of way. I mean it because embracing your flaws and self-knowledge is what I'm going to talk about today. My family moved to New York City from New Jersey in the middle of the year when I was in third grade. I was terrible, I mean truly terrible, at sports and was treated badly by the kids that I went to school with. I fell in love with computers quite quickly, and like many of you, my parents buying me my first computer was a transformative moment in my life. It was an Apple IIc for me, and I, I bet for none of you it was an Apple IIc, I'm sure of that. So my mother asked if I could stay in the computer lab during recess to avoid the torment of the playing field, and the school said no. And so every day I was picked last for touch football, teased, and came home crying. I was lucky enough to switch to collegiate school in third and sixth grade, where I thrived. I became the captain of the debate team, acted in many plays, and did a ton of other clubs. I was like the kid in Rushmore. Do you guys know the movie Rushmore? Everyone at collegiate is like the kid in Rushmore. It's like a little nerd heaven. My whole life, I wanted to be a Disney Imagineer. And now Imagineers built the World's Fair's attractions for Walt in 1964. And then they went on to build all the theme park attractions for Disney for some time. Imagineering is a word that is created, as you would expect, from the pushing together of imagination and engineering. And after my first trip to Epcot at age 12, I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And so in the summer of 1993, when I was 15, when I saw an ad in Scientific American urging me to dial into, with my modem, dial into a bulletin board system, which went by BBS, this was before the internet, you had, had a thing in, you had to hook a phone line into your computer, I'm really dating myself now, uh, I jumped at the chance and I dialed in, and my computer at the time was a nine pound Toshiba gas plasma orange screen luggable laptop. And that was a pretty good computer at the time. I answered a series of personality questions that scrolled across the screen, and then it asked for a resume. 
And because I didn't have a resume, because remember, I'm 15 years old at the time, I wrote ideas that I had for theme park attractions. And I hit click and I sent it in to them. I'd like to say that I was surprised when a week later I got a call from a vice president at Disney Imagineering inviting me out to Glenview, California with my parents, but I wasn't. I may act like I see the glass half empty, but I really am a huge optimist. I deep down always believe that things will work out, but back to Disney. They were looking for adults, but the multiple choice personality test I took when I dialed into that system flagged me as having the traits they were looking for, and they thought my ideas for attractions were cute. And after tours and interviews, I began an amazing internship that lasted for two years at Imagineering, and then several more years when that team moved to Sony to build an urban entertainment complex in the heart of San Francisco. It was like a theme park in a mall, basically. I visited and met with Silicon Graphics, which was the company back in the 90s that made all the amazing graphics for Jurassic Park at the height of its power. And I got to hang around with people making Disney's first virtual reality ride. You were flying on a magic carpet. It was kind of in the Aladdin movie. I got to go to the warehouse where they were developing the Indiana Jones ride. And I got to show Michael Eisner, then CEO of Disney, my intern projects. And to the best of my knowledge, I was the youngest Imagineer in the company's history. Or at least so I was told. Maybe they were just flattering me. But I was like Mike Tom Hanks in the movie Big, for those of you that have seen that movie. That experience got me pretty good mileage. And it and my grades got me into Princeton. But by 2003, I was working in an office park in Northern Virginia as a consultant for Booz Allen to the National Security Agency, the NSA. You see, when I graduated Columbia Business School in 2003, I had applied to Booz Allen to work on media projects. And they had told me that I would be working on media projects. But in the weak 2003 economy, it was NSA or bust. Many of my classmates at Columbia Business School that year had banks rescind offers and the like. The whole experience reinforced for me my deep distrust or dislike for systems, rules, promises, and programs emanating from corporate or institutional establishment. In the evenings of that Booz Allen job, I'd walk from that office park across a parking lot to my hotel and wonder how things had once been so bright and were now so dark. By the age of 30, I felt that the best of my career was behind me. I was like a child actor whose career simply fizzles out. But in that deep sense of rejection from the playground and the roller coaster of being the toast of the town for my work at Disney and then toiling in obscurity and boredom in an office park, I believe laid a blessing. I recognized that external perception and accolades were fickle and fleeting, and perhaps most importantly, fleeting. They take your phone calls one day and they lose your phone number the next. Or maybe today they claim your email went to spam when they see you on the street. People often, often ask how I became the president of BuzzFeed. The answer is simple. They asked, and in 2010, no one else wanted the job. It's really true. Because how else could I have gotten it? I had, like, no experience. In fact, when I took the job, and now, guys, everything I'm telling you is absolutely the truth. This, this story is so mind-boggling, even to me, as I read it to you. In fact, when I took the job, people couldn't believe I was joining that cat site, BuzzFeed. And that is the few people who even knew what BuzzFeed was. But the conventional wisdom was this was a terrible, terrible mistake that I was making. Prior to BuzzFeed, let me tell you about the very bumpy road that led to BuzzFeed. And after that office park in Northern Virginia, I was rejected at the early stages of their existence for jobs at Twitter, Foursquare, and Boxy. Boxy may be, not, may be one you don't know. Boxy was a very, very hot video startup in New York about 10 years ago. In all three cases, I read their API documentation. I hired developers on Elance to build apps on their services in the hopes of winning jobs. I built one of the first tweet schedules for Twitter, a check-in tracker for Foursquare, and a way to get your personal videos on Boxy. Based on that Twitter app, Fred Wilson got me an interview with Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey was ousted the day before I was scheduled to get on a plane to fly to California with him for my second meeting. Ev Williams was kind enough to take the meeting with me, but nothing came of it. I begged Dennis and Naveen, the founders of Foursquare, to hire me as their first business employee. Dennis is a friend to this day. They kindly passed. I suspect they thought I was too intense and too type A. Avner, who is the CEO and founder of Boxy, is a friend, but he passed on me too. And when I ask him why today, he can't even remember. Three swings, 
three brutal strikeouts, three flat-out rejections, and largely rejections of my personality. You see, as much as I try, I can't be chill. I can fake being chill, but I'm a bad poker player at it, which is kind of ironic because I'm actually a pretty good poker player. My experience immediately prior to BuzzFeed was as an employee for a venture capital fund. I ran a startup incubator space for them. I mean, I physically ran it. It was my job to unclog the toilet when the toilet clogged. But it was in that role that I met BuzzFeed, and I'm a master believer as a result in kismet, happy coincidences, and running into people and things. And so to give you a timeline, prior to joining BuzzFeed at the age of 33, which was just five or six years ago, I had a scattered, confused, and unremarkable career. I did not found a startup at age 22, and I was not a Google or Facebook employee, an early Google and Facebook employee, in my mid-20s. And so I arrive at BuzzFeed in the summer of 2010, and BuzzFeed was a site with 6 million people a month visiting it, 15 employees, and almost no revenue. As I mentioned, I got the job because no one else wanted it, and I spent the first two years continually reinventing myself to keep that job and do what the company needed. I made the decks, I sold the ads. Many of my Columbia classmates wanted to do business development or strategy. I sold ads. I made the revenue happen. It was tough and BuzzFeed was not an overnight success and the odds were that I would not last four years. Nothing is promised. Everything is earned. I say that to everyone I hire for a role who's concerned about high, high, how high they can rise. You can rise as high as you can rise. The first two years of BuzzFeed were nearly impossible. People doubted me, my ideas, and my experience. The last doubt was fair because, as I mentioned, I had no experience. I came home every night to my wife, Jill, who's here with me today, fearing that I was on the outs and occasionally reading articles, not that occasionally, doubting me personally and my work, including some that are so brutal that I have them framed on my home office wall. But in years three and four, things fell into place at BuzzFeed. The vision, the team, and the bets played out as we had hoped, more than we had hoped. Facebook took over the world as the pipes for media dissemination. The incumbent media companies stumbled even harder than we could possibly have predicted, and our unique content advertising model, which everyone had doubted, worked and advertisers loved it. The hard work and luck intersected. Throughout this journey and the journey I am still on and we are all on, everyone has told me what I am doing wrong and what is wrong with my personality. And then these judgments tend to flip-flop. One year, I was told I was too energetic and hyper, and in success, 24 months later, I was told every media company needed somebody just as energetic as me. This is why I never get high on my own supply. I know these judgments are simply the result, you guys really like that one. I know these judgments are simply the result of consensus thinking in hindsight, and I know that they flip-flop. The same is true of ideas. Every idea I have ever had, I have been told was the worst before I was told it was the greatest. And I've had bad ideas that stayed bad ideas, plenty of those, but I have never had a good idea that people told me was good initially. For example, when I started working on my new company, Cheddar, a key component was live video. Almost everyone, except the people that backed me, told me that it was a terrible idea. When Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg announced live video as a key focus, everyone then told me how great my idea was. And this flip-flop literally occurred over a period of a few weeks this past spring. Literally in the past few months, as you all know, live video got rolled out. People around me have so often thought they knew better and wanted to tell me how to do and what to be. They were all wrong. Their advice was all expired or never valid. Advice is a backseat driver. Advice is the words someone not on your team and not doing the work with you tells you. I'm not saying you can be a jerk. Here is the rule. If you are good, decent, kind, honest, and loving, rest assured you are doing everything right. If your family loves you and you enjoy your work, which is really your art, that is what matters. Let me give you another example. I've never worked anywhere more than four years. I'm not saying that's a good thing, it's just a thing. It's just part of my composition. I'm too driven by compulsion and anxiety to let things play out. I can't go slow. And so I've moved around and people have called me a job hopper. And until recently, this terribly pained me. 
But then I think about how I got engaged to my wife, Jill, after 10 months of dating. We were engaged for a year, and we are now married for 10. And we've got Edie and Cooper, our two little ones, who were born within 15 months of each other. Like I said, I can't go slow. <laughs> and the people calling me a job hopper, <laughs> I threw that in at the last minute. And the people calling me a job hopper were often divorced or remarried or twice remarried. Now, I'm not criticizing their romantic lives. They just need to leave me alone in mine. Most rules and judgments are arbitrary. And I believe that rules and judgments are the most negative force in the universe. And I believe that self-awareness and self-acceptance are the most freeing and powerful forces, especially for those of us like all of you who are Imagineers. It is hard to Imagineer when you have all that external noise around you. For those of you who chose to Imagineer with your degrees, this essential rejection of rules and judgments is necessary but will create complexity. At my son Cooper's kindergarten parent-teacher conference, he got a great review. With that said, the teacher explained that Cooper spends lots of time on tasks he likes and finds shortcuts on tasks he doesn't like. For example, He's supposed to lay out the blocks in sequence and then trace their length to estimate how, how long the blocks are. Instead, he skips the task of laying out the blocks and just draws the line through estimation. I told the teacher that I thought this was fantastic. <laughs> this speech is suddenly becoming more advice than I wanted to give, violating my no advice rule. So let me wrap this up by reiterating that beyond decency, love, and creativity, Nothing else matters. And you do, in fact, need to wake up each day doing what you want and brushing the haters off your shoulders. Here's a list of what I've been told. You better get better at sports. Debate is for geeks. Computers are for losers. The partners at Booz Allen don't think you're a good associate. Be less type A when you interview at Foursquare and Twitter. You can't switch industries so much. You've switched jobs too much. Don't fight so much with your coworkers at Google. Going to BuzzFeed would be a mistake. Leaving BuzzFeed would be a mistake. <laughs> Live video is a terrible idea for Cheddar. Live video was a genius idea for Cheddar. And this is my favorite one. This was from the same group of investors. Can we please invest in your company? Followed by, your idea is not formed enough for us to invest in your company. Followed by, why didn't you let us invest in your company and took somebody else's money for your company? I've been a Disney Imagineer, a real estate analyst, an internet entrepreneur, a Booz Allen consultant, a stockbroker, a Googler, a venture capitalist, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, uh, a Buzzfeeder, and an entrepreneur all over again. I've been told I'm inexperienced, unfocused, too focused, too intense, too selfish, too ambitious, and not ambitious enough. There are simply too many rules to follow. There are simply too many judgments. It's hard to draw this all to a close without conclusions that will really be advice in sheep's clothing. You graduate today as engineers, people who create things, people who invent things from the ether. That's what we all do and love doing. What I have found for me is that every moment spent trying to understand the arbitrary rules and judgments is time that is taken away from the inventions, or even worse, pollution in the atmosphere of your minds. It takes time away from creativity. It's moments dealing with someone else's hang-ups when you could be playing with your kids or sketching wireframes. I learn this lesson more with every passing day. Let me end with my hope for all of us. In choosing this path of engineering and in completing your degrees, you've demonstrated your love for creating and inventing, your love of Imagineering. This is not an easy degree to get. And so my hope for all of you and even myself is that we spend all our days and minutes inventing and loving, because those are the most powerful and important forces in the universe. And I truly believe that the way to get there is to continually repeat this mantra to yourself any time you face doubt or haters. That Shakespeare line I love so much, this above all, to thine own self be true. That's it. Thank you.